Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Sean Gio. I'm the policy director at the Partnership for Strong Communities. And on behalf, of, on behalf of the partnership, I want to welcome you to the next session of Connecticut's Affordable Housing Conference in 2023. Uh, we're going to fe we are featuring local, state, and national experts that lead conversations that explore challenges, share best practices, and coalesce us around critical next steps to address key affordable housing issues in our state. This year, the conference is focused on thriving communities, and each session spotlights a unique approach to strengthening housing stability for households and communities across the state. <clears throat> so. Today, we have an exciting plenary session for you, where you'll have the opportunity to hear from Connecticut Housing Finance Authority's research marketing and outreach team as they unpack housing market trends and share data on the state's housing affordability gap. Um, but before we turn it over to our presenters, we'd like to thank our leading sponsor, the Connecticut fin Housing Finance Authority. Uh, our visionary sponsors, the Connecticut Department of Housing, Wells Fargo, our champion sponsors, Bank of America, D'Amelio, J. D'Amelio and Associates, m and Bank, Webster Bank, and the Mel Melville Charitable Trust. And our foundation sponsors, Federal Home Loan Bank of Boston, Cohen Resnick, and Trinity Financial. These sponsors' deep support has allowed the conference to happen again this year. Uh, so a few housekeeping items before we get started. The session's being recorded, and all recordings will be available as soon as possible on our YouTube channel. If you have a technology issue, please select the chat icon in the Zoom control panel and send it in the chat to um, Sean, Sean Gill. We will do our best to assist you. Your speakers will let you know how they'd like content questions to be submitted. Uh, after the session, you can complete a session feedback survey by clicking on the megaphone icon in the lobby. And we appreciate your feedback. With that, I'll now turn it over to our first speaker, Andrew Boulder. Hi, I'm actually gonna I'm oh, gonna hop in quickly before sorry, Andy. Kayla. <laughs> no worries, Sean. Um, hi, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kayla Giordano, and I am a senior um, and research data analyst at the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. I'm gonna be moderating the session today and leading us through some questions later on. Um, this session is gonna have kind of a two-part approach. Um, the first 15, 20 minutes or so, we're going to be hearing from staff at CHFA about Connecticut's housing market needs and sort of giving everyone a level set um, of knowledge so that in the back half of the hour, we can hear from some panelists about the work that their organizations are doing around um, advancing affordable housing, um, talk about some challenges, some solutions. So I'm really excited uh, for the next hour. Um, thank you very much to the partnership, to Sean, uh, Danielle and Chelsea for all the work that they've done in, in helping to prepare this, this great conference. Um, before I hand it over to, to that presentation about Connecticut's housing market needs, I do want to sort of introduce everyone that's going to be speaking in the next hour. Um, so I'm going to start with Jocelyn Ayer. Jocelyn is the director of the Litchfield County Center for Housing Opportunity. Um, at her work at the Center for Housing Opportunity, she works with towns to help advance their affordable housing goals, as well as providing project management and capacity building to nonprofits working in the housing space. So welcome, Jocelyn. Thank you for being here. Uh, we also have Greg Ugaldi. Greg is the president of TMN Building, um, one of Connecticut's largest home builders. His organization has built over 4,000 homes um, from trade-ups to starter homes. Um, so he has lots of expertise in what we're going to be talking about today, the problem of supply. Greg is also the past president of the National Association of Home Builders, and he serves on the board here at the Connecticut Housing Finance Authority. Thanks for being here, Greg. Um, and last but not least, we have Leslie Figueroa. She is a realtor at Keller Williams, as well as the incoming president of the Fairfield County chapter of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Um, so she brings um, a lot of um, great experience working on the ground um, with people who are dealing with the problem of supply. Uh, and we also have um, my colleague, Andrew Boulder, Bolger. Um, he is a senior research and data analyst here at the research marketing and outreach team at CHFA. And for the past year, he has really led the charge in updating CHFA's statewide housing needs assessment. 
And so he's going to kick us off this afternoon uh, with a short presentation on the statewide housing market needs um, to help sort of frame the conversation in the back half of the hour. So with that, I will hand it over to you, Andrew. Sure. Thank you, Kayla. Uh, really quickly, I'm going to share my screen. Everybody can see that, right? Right. So as a uh... As Kayla mentioned, this uh, presentation centered around Connecticut's recent or the CHFA's recently published housing needs assessment, or HNA for short. Uh, it's a really a kind of a, a all-purpose document, and it's intended for, to serve as a resource for both CHFA and its partners, really to guide our work with as close to real-time data as possible. Uh, it's really split into kind of four sections, three of which we're going to dive into today. It talks about demographics and housing stock uh, implications from resulting from the pandemic. Uh, and then housing gap analysis, all of which we're going to get into. Uh, it incorporates data from HUD, Census, uh, CoStar, which is basically the back end of apartments.com, Zillow, uh, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act, and many, many more uh, sources as well. Um, and it's available on our website, just chfa.org slash HNA. I would encourage each and every one of you to take a look because a lot, a lot of work uh, and time went into it, and we think it's pretty, pretty insightful. So, so we can't... Uh, starting off, we can't really talk about the housing market without talking about the people that actually occupy the units that we all help produce, right? Um, and so the narrative Connecticut has really told itself over the last couple of years, putting aside the most recent report stating that we picked up roughly 60,000 uh, new residents last year, is that we're either, you know, flattened population or declining in some areas. And generally speaking, over the last five years, that's been true, where we see population increases in some areas, decreases in other, other areas. But what is universally true across every county in the state is that we're seeing an uptick in household formation. Um, the census defines household formation as a uh, household as basically anytime someone occupies a new housing unit. Um, so the typical example is, you know, two parents and their, their child, a uh, recent graduate gets their first job, moves into their first apartment. That original household of three is now one household of two and another household of one. And this is good. This is, you know, in normal times, this is, this is great. This is what we want. It's an economic driver. But when we're not pairing that with the appropriate level of new housing production, that's when it ends up putting pressure on the existing housing stock. So what you're looking at here is the uh, building permits back to 1966. And you can see, you know, generally 60, 70 unit is, and 80s, we were producing somewhere 15 to 20,000 unit, new units per year. Uh, generally, the 90s, we were hovering around uh, 90s into the 2000s, roughly 10,000 units. And then Great Recession really hit us hard, and we saw a significant drop in uh, per, uh, permits for new construction, particularly among uh, one unit or single family production. Um, one kind of bright spot here is in the kind of the 2010s, actually, the multifamily numbers, uh, five or more unit in red there, was actually uh, continuing at a pretty decent, decent pace. Um, but what this the increased household formation and lack thereof of new permitting has done is really really put a lot of pressure on the existing housing stock and we saw that play out over the course of that pandemic um it's caused a whole host of factors but i think the most we think the most important um trend to come out of it is the drop in for sale inventory um across the state and country so the for sale inventory basically means whenever you log on to zillow and you just take a look at what's available for sale. That's basically for sale inventory. And pre-pandemic 2019, 2018, we would, depending on the season, this, uh, the month generally have roughly 18,000 units um, or homes for sale at any given time. There's some seasonality to that, increasing in the summer, decreasing in the winter, but generally hovering around that 18,000 mark. And you can see in the middle here, um, starting in roughly March, 2020, we didn't really have that seasonal increase in that, in, in that inventory number. And it's declined really ever since. So most recent number, we're right, right below kind of 6,000 total units for sale. That's roughly a third of what we had at this time uh, pre-pandemic. Um, I will note, you can see in that, that blue line here, that's the inventory nationwide um, on the other, the other axis here. So it's, it's not just a Connecticut problem. It's um, a problem nationwide, but it's, it's a significant problem. It's, it's, it's even more of a problem for Connecticut in the Northeast than it is, say, nationwide. You know, the, the country has roughly 50% of the inventory we did that, that it did pre-pandemic. Connecticut has roughly a third. So it's even more of a problem here. So with that decreased supply and kind of stable household formation and demand, 
uh, we've seen prices really tick up pretty notably. So what you're looking at here is the percent of listings sold above their listing price by month uh, for Connecticut and, and the US. And you can again see right around the start of the pandemic, this number uh, ticked up notably. Um, again, you can see the divergence between the US and Connecticut, but I'll just note that um, you know pre-pandemic, this number was roughly 20%. Uh, in recent months and years, it's been approaching 80% in some markets in some months. So really significant uh, competition there. And then we've also seen just homes coming off the market much faster. This is the mean number of days um, until pending, basically how long the market or how long the home's on the market for. Pre-pandemic, again, we saw uh, between, depending on the market you're looking at, 50 to 100 days on average beginning uh, there after the pandemic, that number dropped to roughly 25, even below 20 in some markets. So homes are, you know, there's less available, they're going for more than listed for, and they're moving faster off the market as well. Um, further confounding all of that in terms of affordability is what the Fed has been doing to counter inflation. Uh, so in the span of roughly two years, 18 months, we went from uh, average rates around 3% to now approaching 8% uh, in, in recent months. And you can see historically in the green line here, 8% rates are not historically abnormal. You know, in the 80s, we had rates approaching 18%. But what is abnormal for at least the last generation is the rate, how fast that rate has, the average 30 year fixed rate has gone up. So between October 2022 and the year prior, in the October and the year prior, we have the largest increase, year-over-year -year increase in that average 30 year fixed rate since 1981. So that's just really, for, when we combine it with all the factors we just laid out, really um, limiting the options for home buyers, and especially first time home buyers as well, which is really complicating the affordability equation. Um, pivoting kind of towards the rental market more so uh, here, because they don't, you know these markets don't happen in a vacuum. Um, from one another. So beginning again, start of uh, first quarter 2020, we saw a dramatic drop in vacancy rates, again, in part due to this household formation phenomena, but also probably in part due to the um, hot single family market, kind of locking out potential renters that would otherwise be homeowners. Um, so pre-pandemic, we saw vacancy rates um, across markets of roughly four or 5%. Uh, Mid 2021, 2022, we saw some uh, vacancy rates hit bottoming out around 2%, um, particularly in the New Haven and in the Norwich, the New London area. Um, we've rebounded since, but with that really low vacancy rate, what that does is give landlords obviously a lot of power to um, raise, raise rents in some cases. So this is the year over year rent uh, growth by metro and month, same, same, or by quarter, excuse me. Um, and we can see in Hartford, New Haven, and the Stanford markets, year-over-year -year rent growth of roughly around eight nine percent uh, last year. Particularly in the Norwich market, uh, we saw rent growth topping out at roughly twelve percent um, uh, late last year. These numbers are these rates are coming down, and I think that's now <laughs> that's the one kind of bright spot you could say in this in this whole story. It's a lot of there's a lot of doom and gloom, but the Fed is watching this number. It makes up a large portion of what goes into their inflation estimate. So as this number comes down, the year of year rent growth comes down, we could see potentially um, Fed kind of easing. We're, we're already, already seeing it play out, starting to ease uh, ease off on the rate increases, and that might bring some more stability to the housing market overall. But that's that remains to be seen. So the kind of next the kind of crucial piece of the HNA is what's called the housing gap analysis. Um, it's the methodology developed by the American Planning Association, and it really tries to get at um, the kind of mixed match of units on the market in a, a given area and try to uh, describe a number, not necessarily a production number, but just a measure of need in a certain area and among a certain uh, income band of renters and homeowners. So the gap is calculated by taking the number of households uh, in a given area, in this case, for this example, zero to 30 AMI renters in Hartford County, subtracting the total number of affordable units that are available to this, this um, rental group, renter group, and adding back in the number of units occupied by other income households. So in this case, the way this is shown is on the left, you have the total number of households um, in this group 
shaded by whether or not they're cost burden or not. That's dark blue is cost burden, light blue not. And on the right, you have the total number of units that are affordable and available to this group of households, um, shaded by whether they're occupied by someone in this AOI band or whether they're occupied by someone, in this case, at a higher income band. Um, so it, what you can see here is that there are more households than units. There, that creates just an outright shortage. But the shortage is even, or the gap is made even worse by the fact that there are units that are priced for these households occupied by higher income renters. So when we zoom out statewide, um, there's a lot of colors and bars, so I realize this might be a little confusing for folks, but just looking at kind of the 30,000 foot view, what you can see is that there are outright shortages of units for renters earning under 30% AMI and over 80% AMI. Um, with, and so what that then causes, so there's more households than units in those income bands, that then leads them to occupy units that are priced for folks earning 31 to 50% and 51 to 80% AMI as well. So while the, well, there's actual more, actually more units than households in these two income bands, they're basically competing with uh, re rental households that are both earning more and earning less than, um, than they do. And thereby that creates a shortage in those income bands as well. Um, so, you know, what this, I think, and we're going to get into solutions and, and, um, and programs later on in this discussion and throughout the conference. But what I think what this calls for is kind of a twofold uh, solution, both kind of that deep, deep income targeting for the lowest income uh, renters, but also potentially a solution to alleviate the shortage at the, at the other spectrum of the market. And I'll just shout out the um, Build 4CT program, which is um, actively um, being rolled out. And it's kind of aimed at that, that middle tier uh, middle priced uh, housing, kind of 60% to 120% AMI. So, I mean, it, it's actively being rolled out, but in the long run, you know, if that program's successful, we could see a, a, some kind of alleviation of the pressure in the middle of the market as units get freed up um, for those renters. On the owner side, it's a bit of a different kind of nuanced story. What you immediately see is that there are more households than there are units for uh, owners earning above 100% AMI. It's a it, it, again a nuanced story because when you what we know about the average homeowner is that they generally stay in their home for an average of seven years, at least pre-pandemic times. Um, so you could in theory have someone who bought their home when they were earning say 75% AMI. It was perfectly affordable to them at the time and they've since since seen their incomes uh, go up um, over the over that seven years. So maybe they're now earning 110% AMI and they would fall into this bucket here while occupying a unit that is theoretically affordable to someone in a lower income range. But you know what this I think calls for is just support and production for that kind of entry level starter home, maybe affordable to someone at 80% AMI um, around that range. So that was a lot of information and I hopefully didn't depress everyone. Um, but with that, I'm going to hand it back to Kayla to um, to facilitate the discussion. Thanks, Andrew. Um, that was really great. And just to reiterate, um, this was only a sample of what is available in the CHFA statewide housing needs assessment. Um, the document itself is 60 pages, just chock full of data and graphs that we hope will really serve to help um, your communities and your organizations with your own work around affordable housing, or even just to satisfy personal curiosity, um, if you're data nerds like we are over here uh, on the Remo team. Um, so we're going to move into a facilitated discussion. Um, and Greg, I'm going to start um, with you, if that's all right. Um, you know, Andrew sort of called out these lagging building permit numbers. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, you know, why has production been lagging in Connecticut and what are some of the challenges that we've seen historically, but also in the last couple of years around getting housing going? Uh, fair question, too. And, and Kayla, let me just start, too, by telling everyone that if they heard information that Andrew was outlining and it peaked questions or, the, you know, it, it started generating other thoughts, make sure that you get in touch because Kayla, um, she'll she'll take down 
what information we need to get down. We get briefed at every meeting we have um, that the board has at CHFA and it's valuable information. And we're happy to share that and, and get people thinking along those lines. Um, it's terrific. It really is. And it's valuable. So when we look at the state of Connecticut, um, I had, uh, in, in Kayla had mentioned in the introductions that I had the opportunity to serve um, nationally as our leader for the Home Builders Association. So it brought me to every state and so that I could see what was going on on the ground and compare it to my home state where we actually um, do our building and developing. And we have quite a few different pressures that, that are very unique. And um, it's, it's certainly not lack of demand. The, the demand is there, as you saw Andrew's charts, how we're bidding up prices, and it's difficult to get uh, construction going. Um, we have the five L's, we call it, and I'll just do it briefly because in Kayla, we could come back to these things, but uh, the labor pressures, the cost of land and lots and their scarcity lending both for acquisition development and construction but also for the mortgages at the end of the day we try to help that at chaffin but there, there's all pressure there's a lot of pressure there we call it lumber but just the material costs overall up 20 percent year over year at least and uh you know there was a time when lumber itself would add eighteen thousand dollars to the price of a home and then your legal regulations where you know when you look at the regulatory burdens on a home in Connecticut it's well over 25 percent it can approach 30 percent and it certainly is over that for multifamily but the regulatory burdens are incredible when you look at the purchase price of a home especially in new construction we can break it out that way so you Bring all the things in. I mean, just labor, focus on that for a minute. We have 400,000 job openings around the country, very high in New England, where the average age of a plumber and an electrician is 65 years or older. So we have a lot of different pressures that are forcing prices up and also forcing a scarcity of the lots and the land that we need to be able to build on. I think that sets the stage for this conversation and shows you how difficult it is in the Northeast and specifically in Connecticut, where we have some of the highest property values and home values in the country. That's great. Thank you, Greg. I think that that really does help the, those five L's really help to sort of frame the way of looking at that. Um, I'm going to shift over to Leslie because, you know, we, we heard from, from Andrew and then from Greg, like what, what's happening, what's preventing the production. But um, I wonder if, if you could talk a little bit about your experience working with um, your, your real estate clients and trying to purchase a home or trying to rent um, an apartment. You know, what, what's this been like on the ground uh, for you and for your clients? Um, thank you for having me, by the way. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. And thank you, Andrew, for that information. I feel like education is key, especially in this profession that we're all in. Um, so what I'm seeing as far as a trend is that even, you know, the normal income based family can no longer achieve the American dream of home ownership because of the struggles and the crisis that we're seeing of inventory, but not only inventory, um, also rental. Uh, information as well is really important on this because eviction numbers have actually gone up since the pandemic. So because landlords are noticing that they can get more for their properties. So whoever is renting is not only struggling to afford a home for their family, but now they can't even afford buying a home because those prices have skyrocketed. It's no longer offering $5,000 um, over asking. It's $20,000 over asking, $30,000 over asking. So this crisis just continues. But as um, a solution for all of this, I mean, it's just educating your realtor so that they know that Patience is key at this point. A lot of the buyers, unfortunately, are not going to be looking in the market for three to four months. They're going to probably be extending that search for, for a year. And it's a trend that we're seeing since the pandemic started. So education, patience, just letting a buyer know what's going on in the state, also on a national level, but locally is the biggest um, opportunity 
for, for education for all of our clients, for all of the realtors, for all of the lenders, um, anybody who is interesting in the housing market period. Um, we, I actually am part of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. And what we're doing is we're actually getting involved with local nonprofit um, opportunities so that we can see how we can provide additional knowledge to anybody who's looking for the resources so that this way we can um, better serve our clients. For example, the Bridgeport Regional Business Council actually is a group for Fairfield County, it's Stratford, Bridgeport, and Trumbull. And what they're doing, we met with them to see what they're trying to implement so that we can better serve the community because of all of these crises that are has happening in the housing market. And they are actually trying to get in touch, communicate amongst one another and see what opportunities are out there. Let's say if there are, um, you know, uh, commercial buildings that have been abandoned, is there a way to actually convert those into um, residential properties. Yeah, thanks, Leslie. Um, I think that transitions nicely to um, back over to, to Jocelyn. Um, you know, Litchfield is, is very different from a lot of different parts of Connecticut um, that might be more urban. And we often hear a lot of, of talk around um, housing construction in more urban or suburban areas. But, you know, the, the rural nature of Litchfield makes um, all these things just a little bit different um, and maybe a little more challenging. So I wonder if you can talk about um, your work a little bit and how you tried to, you know, what have been the challenges um, in, in trying to get housing production going? Yeah, I mean, we're seeing a, a lot of, of similar challenges in Litchfield County that Andrew pointed out, um, you know, including, uh, you know, housing costs just skyrocketing and limited inventory of um, rental housing. One of the uh, one of the issues that we're seeing that has really limited further the inventory of rental housing is uh, short-term rentals and Airbnbs. Uh, that is, um, you know, happening quite a lot of the units that used to be rented year-round in our small towns are now, um, you know, just rented short-term. Uh, so what was already a limited number of rental housing options here um, has gotten even, even more limited. So working with our communities to think about, it's, it's difficult, especially for small towns to regulate um, short-term rentals. You know, it's, uh, they're good to have, um, but also if they sort of take over your rental market, um, that presents other uh, challenges for folks that want to rent. Uh, year round. So that's one thing we're working on. Um, I have seen a lot of towns um, in their housing plans that sort of, I will say, have an over-reliance on ADUs or accessory apartments um, to solve their housing supply challenges. Um, and again, especially in the smaller towns, uh, those accessory dwelling units and accessory apartments often turn into Airbnbs or short-term rentals. So it doesn't really deal with that kind of supply issue. Um, to one of Greg, Greg's points about just finding land um, that you can afford to build uh, affordable housing on, um, you know, one of the things we've started doing is working with actually together with our, lo our, our local and regional conservation organizations. Um, because um, often people want to donate land to them and think of them first, um, but sometimes they're also open to donating land for creating housing opportunity. Uh, and so um, we have started engaging with conservation organizations who are very open to the conversation if donors come to them with land um, that isn't a high priority to them for conservation. Um, and then we can have the conversation about whether that donor is open to um, providing that land to create some housing, uh, affordable housing opportunities on. So that's a, just a couple of things that we're working on, um, you know, short-term rentals, working together with conservation organizations. And then we can, we can support them as well, because again, in our rural communities, we need both uh, housing that's affordable and also, you know, we need to preserve open space um, and, uh, you know, other areas for, for clean air and clean water. But 
So kind of working together on that has been something that we've been working on. Thank you, Jocelyn. And, and Jocelyn kind of already started getting a little bit to some of the, the solutions and new things that her organization is working on. So um, I want to open it up to, to Leslie or Greg to, to jump in. And Jocelyn, if you have other ideas too, you know, what are some of the proposed solutions? Like how do we start addressing um, this issue of supply? Um, cause, cause as Andrew said, you know, sometimes we, we see these numbers of that 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 chart where the, the building permits going down and housing prices going up, we we get a little depressed, right? Or how are we gonna solve what seems like this really monumental issue? So um I'd love to have a conversation around, you know, what are some of um some of the some of the new things that we can look to 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 help us. Oh, you're oh, muted. You're <laughs> So one of the things that it got stuck for a second um, that, that we look at, and now this goes back for quite a few years with our home Connecticut efforts. Um, so, you know, Sean, I, I see him on the screen. We, we've worked on this for years. And what happens when you look at density, the overall density for uh, a, whenever you have land use requirements, we think that it overburdens the process when you increase the the need for more acreage to get a building lot. So if you have two acre zoning where you could get away with a lot less, um, and it's even more than that at, at, at times, to pick appropriate spots where everybody could agree that the land can support a higher density is really something we have to take a look at because picture what can happen if you have a conservation community where you have surrounded by open space but where you the footprint that you're going to build on you increase the number of units that you can build there you're building less road you don't have to bring the improvements in quite that the distance so that's sewer water even septic and well you could cut down on depending on how your um you propose to do the development but it makes a lot of sense and i think in this state we've really gotten away from this when, when you look at the not in my, my backyard type of argument and position it's really driven up the cost certainly of housing in the state but more importantly it's really added to the scarcity and what we can bring to the marketplace we have to take a look at that and remember that figure that i gave you where you know regulations are contributing already to such a high uh, portion of your purchase price to streamline approvals and really look at what regulations are absolutely needed and decrease those where we can that will drive down price, but it will also, and more importantly, increase the inventory in this state and allow a lot of our first time, you know, first responders and our, our students and people to stay in Connecticut and move, be attracted to Connecticut. Thanks, Greg. Yeah, I think you're spot on. <laughs> how about how about you, Leslie? Um is there, is there anything that um, you'd, you'd like to see to, to help solve this issue? And I guess maybe like the second question, um, yeah, as a realtor, where you're, when you're helping your clients, like what is the type of housing that your clients are looking for? Like what, what do you see as what we really need in the state? Um, most of my clients are looking for that first purchase, right? Their first home. Um, so that's where we're seeing most of the struggle because now, because of the limited inventory, you see that investors are actually going for those single families as well. And so we have in the, in the state of Connecticut, we have regulations in regards to evictions, protecting, um, renters from not getting evicted from, you know, prices not getting ridiculously high due to landlords, um, wanting to increase that we have, you know, the, that's the, uh, we also had the fair rent commission that came in when the pandemic was there, where, um, the renters were able to catch up with any late payments, landlords were happy, but it just still, there is still that crisis of there's no single family. There's investors that are coming in, taking those single families and renting them out to families that could, could have afforded them. So maybe putting something in place where, you know, firsthand, I know HUD has a program where they 
don't go through the investors first. They go through the first to the family who's trying to own a home. Um, and then they move on to investor opportunities. Maybe having that or, or housing that is provided for, you know, um, middle class families. Something that can be implemented on a on a level where it can be fair housing for everybody. Jocelyn, is there is there anything else that you wanted to add in terms of solutions that you'd like to see? Well, I, I guess I'll just note one other thing that we're doing here in Litchfield County, which is again really working directly with local housing nonprofits. So the folks on the ground who are working to implement their town's housing plan um, and they're seeing opportunities every day. So we work directly with them to provide sort of professional um, support and some more capacity to these volunteer led groups uh, to look into opportunities and really kind of make them happen. Um, that's been uh, you know, very uh, successful so far uh, and um, one other thing that we're trying to help them with, um, you know, as Andrew mentioned uh, in his presentation, we're seeing that, uh, you know, you don't have very long to respond to some of these opportunities um, when something comes on the market. And so especially our local housing nonprofits, they don't have cash to, you know, immediately, you know, uh, respond if, you know, something that's relatively affordable comes on the market. So we're working on creating uh, an acquisition revolving loan fund that we can utilize to really, you know, get them access to those funds immediately so they can respond in the same way that some of those investors are able to respond because they have, you know, deeper pockets than our local housing nonprofits. Yeah, I think that's great. I think, I know we haven't talked about it much, but the availability of resources, especially for small developers, um, is definitely a big obstacle for um, those organizations that are trying to address affordable housing, maybe on a smaller scale than a developer that we might deal with at CHFA, um, but that nonetheless is a really important part of that housing ecosystem, right? We need the um, the big projects, but we also need um, the smaller ones to really make like a, a robust community where people have a lot of housing choice. Well, and can I just add real quick, Kayla, um, yeah. to Greg's point around basically proactively deciding in your community where you where higher density housing could go. I think maybe many of us remember the incentive housing zone <laughs> um, program, which I think was terrific. And many of the communities in Litchfield County did decide to think about and proactively plan for where they would like to see that type of housing go and then adopted an overlay zone that would really help create it. I think pairing that with local housing groups that have the capacity to develop those options. Again, and I'm just speaking about Litchfield County um, specifically, but I think that that was a really successful effort that the state um, incentivized through, you know, uh, funding to help communities plan for that, consider where they should go and help them write those regulations and, and get that passed. Um, Leslie or Greg, do you have anything uh, that you want to add before we start taking some questions? No? Oh, go ahead. You Greg. know, I, I just think that it's interesting, this the new approach to ADUs that we have. I really think that once we start unpacking that concept and looking at what it means, I think there's a lot of wisdom behind allowing um, in, in the right places, right reasons. We, you, you know, each community has to decide on what's best for them. But any time that you can capitalize on built in infrastructure already with the road systems, you know, schools, it, it, there's a lot of good things happening in many areas where we could benefit from this tremendously. And I think that we will see um, quite quite a few advantages as we move forward um, with, with that. I think Sean has something for us on the questions and answers. We might be having some trouble with the questions. Yes, as as, uh, as typical with this, we're having some trouble with the, one of the technical functions, a question and answer uh, feature. So uh, what we're going to do is 
if uh, folks do have questions, they, they should be able to raise their hands. And um, Kayla, are you going to be leading the? Yes. Q &A? Yeah. So then, Kayla, you can okay. um, you can let us know who to you select. Great. Yeah. So um, if you have a question, raise your hand and you'll you'll get um, into the queue. Um, it looks like we have a question from Patricia Rock. Looks like Patricia, you might be able to ask if you're. Thank you very much. I'm familiar with the Connecticut Zoning Act um, Atlas, and I'd like to have um, hear some things about that, whether or not that has created more open dialogue to identify opportunities for affordable development throughout the state. Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. Um, so CHFA isn't involved in the development of the zoning atlas. Um, I'm not sure, Jocelyn, if you've had experience um, with using the tool or, or anyone else, Andrew, Leslie or Greg, who might be able to speak to it. Um, we I, I think, uh, the, yeah, the zoning atlas was was I guess I haven't honestly, I haven't seen our planning and zoning commissions utilize the atlas. Um, I think uh, most of the towns in my, again, in Litchfield County do have their own housing plans uh, where there is information about what other zoning tools they could utilize. And also we do have a regional uh, housing needs analysis as well that points out the zoning tools that are, you know, applicable and that could be utilized uh, in various communities. But I, I haven't seen the Atlas honestly uh, used m many times in Litchfield County towns uh, around what other just tools could be implemented. To, you know, and just to, to I, I agree, I think that what's going to happen with that for it to become a really a viable tool is I think a lot of education has to go um, into and, and really bringing that into um, focus and what the advantages are um, because I do think there's a lot of promise there. Anytime that we can help to educate our volunteer and elected boards that are doing planning and zoning, uh, taking on those functions around the state, we're much better off. And a lot of these, P, the, these, the work that goes into these, we just need to be able to communicate it better and start. It, I think you'll see the use of it picked up quite a bit. Yeah, Greg, to your point, um, you know, just having that extra tool that can really help like individuals in their own communities um, to go to their planning and zoning boards or, um, you know, to speak with their elected officials about, hey, this is what's going on. Um, this is what's impacting our community. Um, that and um, along with the housing needs assessment can can really be used um, as a tool. Um, let's see, uh, William Cromwell. Hi, my question was uh, mostly for Greg on the regulations. Um, are there any specific like state regulations that are adding to the cost? I, I know with local zoning, it urges a large amount, but are there any state regulations? And if there are, they're adding significantly to cost, what um, other states could make it look to copy on those regulations? So, so I think you broke up a bit, but I, I think I got the the um, just to your question. Um, what are some of the um, state of Connecticut regulations that impact the cost specifically? Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting because any time that we just implemented a new building code. And, um, you know, we, without going into the merits of it, there's a lot of provisions that we need to see to, to protect um, the environment, to do um, energy conservation, resiliency. There's a lot of good things that the codes bring, but there is a cost to a lot of um, implementation uh, materials and just the, the labor and things that, that go into any time that you bring in a, in a new process. And those can be estimated, you know, between ten and twenty thousand dollars loosely. We'll have a that the code's brand new and we're coming into a time now where we will uh, be able to quantify some of these numbers more as we go but that's an example you know building codes and whenever you look at deep and environmental requirements wetlands um you know inspection 
costs and fees. So anytime that you have a process that, that involves that and, and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that we, we need to get rid of it all. A lot of it's very much needed and supported. It's just that we have to find a way to maybe combine some things and maybe figure out when they're needed and at what point and maybe not duplicate a lot of things. So, you know, and, and you can go on, um, but, but you see where I'm going with that and rather it's a little tough to get into specifics here, but it's something that we keep a close eye on. And depending on the community, they even vary some. So that there's a lot that goes into it, but I, I think that that was a pretty good flavor of what we're talking about. Thanks, Greg. Um, let's see, how about Sarah Locke? Hello. Um, my question was primarily for Jocelyn, but I'd love to hear from anyone. Jocelyn, you mentioned uh, working with conservation groups. Um, I also live in a, in a somewhat rural community. And um, one of the frustrations we've come across is that a, a piece of land, if it's gonna be conserved, has to be wholly conserved and none of it can be built upon in order to capitalize on state grant money for the purchase of, of that land. Um, and I was wondering whether you have found a successful way to work with conservation groups on the same piece of land, as opposed to just deciding who gets it. Um, in the form of uh, conservation subdivision or, or other creative ways to build on the land? Um, my short answer is no, <laughs> um, but uh, it definitely has been done. I mean, again, our conversations with conservation organizations in Litchfield County has really just started um, and mostly has been around, um, as you mentioned, sort of uh, a, a specific parcel and whether it makes more sense for housing or or for conservation, not necessarily um, uh, doing it together on the same parcel. However, we know that that is happening all over, um, that a you know big portion of the uh, you know land could be conserved. Um, and we have some examples of that here in Litchfield County. For example, the Litchfield Housing Trust, uh, did a project with um, eight uh, home ownership, affordable home ownership homes, and then nine acres of conserved land that the local Litchfield Land Trust um, is holding in preservation. So, um, so we do have some examples of that. Um, and there is a recent uh, the the Land Trust Alliance, or sorry, the land, yeah the Land Trust Alliance, which is a national organization, recently put out a guide about how land trusts can start working with affordable housing organizations. And there are some specific examples in that guidebook. Um, and if you can't find it on their website, I'd be happy to send it to you. Um, but there's some examples of how groups can work on the same parcel. Uh, in there as well. Thanks, Jocelyn. Thanks, Sarah. Um, let's see. Um, I see Brian G raised his hand again. We could try again to see if um, if his audio is working. Hello. Hi, Brian. We can hear you now. <laughs> All right. Good. Good. Sorry about that. Um, I, I had a quick question, and it's. I mean, Andrew, this might be in your world. Um, you know, I know the state of Connecticut, uh, I'm sorry, not the state of Connecticut, uh, state of New York, um, through their Sony May program, just, uh, I think they allocated like, like 80 or $90 million um, of forgivable grant money, I think up to $125,000 um, for those that are looking to put in ADUs. Um, curious if there's anything out there on the state level or, you know, through your organization that, you know, they might be working on, whether it's, uh, grant money or, you know, lenders that, you know, will have, you know, aggressive second mortgages, you know, just, just wondering how people can finance these things if the towns actually get on board and, uh, you know, start allowing them. Thanks, Brian. Um, Andrew, you feel free to jump in too. I was just going to, to say that um, at, at CHFA, yeah. we don't have anything specifically um, that, you um, allows for the financing of ADUs. Um, there are several other agencies, um, as you mentioned, in, in New York and, and across the country that are beginning to explore um, financing um, around that area. Uh, Andrew, I don't know if you had anything you wanted to add. Yeah, I would just meant, like say that, as Greg mentioned, the concept in Connecticut's fairly new. So I don't know that any, I'm not aware of anything that's been stood up in a robust way. What I will say is one thing that CHFA does offer is the time to own program 
where first time home buyers can get up to up to fifty thousand dollars in a forgivable grant for the purchase of a home. And I think what's really powerful about that, and we mentioned it during uh, my presentation, is just given the market dynamics we're seeing right now, it's really allowing first time home buyers to keep up and also just to get access in what is otherwise a really tough market. Yeah, and, and Andrew, just to Brian's just to Brian's point also is that that it is something that we'll be watching very closely because you you can tell that it it appears to be a resource that that we definitely have to look to tap into the best we can and if, if we have to stand up financing, um, Andrew, you're absolutely right that that's what we'll be looking to do. And, and and Andrew, to your point as well, um, you know, through the Time to Own program and and other first time home buyer programs at CHFA, as well as many other um, great organizations offer across the state, um, if we can get people into homes, then there's more opportunity to build ADUs in the future, um, especially if that home is affordable to them, that they have some extra income that they might be able to invest in an ADU um, to to really help us address that affordable housing crisis. So, thank you for that question, Brian. Um, let's see, how about Carrie Shea? Hello. Hi, um, Carrie, we can hear you. Great. Um, so in many places in Connecticut, <clears throat> there is the land, um, there are vacant buildings, uh, there's the opportunity for rehab and new construction. The zoning would allow, you know, two family, three family, four family, particularly um, <clears throat> for home ownership. At the national level, there, uh, a number of us have been working for years on the Neighborhood Homes Investment Act, which would essentially fill the gap between what it costs to renovate or build new housing for home ownership <clears throat> and what it appraises at, which is often quite lower, especially in distressed communities. Um, is Connecticut working on anything like that? And is there something that jumps out at you that might actually prevent Connecticut from doing something because there there is a um, there have been some nascent conversations about maybe doing something at the state level like Ohio recently did they passed a tax credit to fill the gap between what it costs to build or renovate and um, and what a, a post construction appraisal might bear. Haley, do you want me to answer that? Oh yeah, sure. go ahead, Greg. Sure. Yeah. Oh okay. So so. You know, it, it, to me, that's a, a very interesting um, question, and it it opens up a lot of thought that's going into that right now. So, so I was at meetings in D.C. last week, and one of the things that we were talking about. Let me start with the, this this whole post pandemic. Um, rental issue, like how many people are coming into the office? What does office usage look like right now? And should we be taking any um, step backs in trying to put residential housing in some of the unneeded office space? So to your point, um, this would also include uh, A office space, A plus even, you know, I mean, triple A. So but the number nationally right now is less than 1% when we look at it. So we have a lot of room in this area. Now, if you take it a step further and say where these communities are really crying out to look at some of these beautiful old buildings, they, they just are, are, you know, it, it does. And it, it's interesting because we get into this at Chaffa. So when we give CHFA approvals, especially on some of the tax credit deals, we're, we're looking to preserve affordability throughout the state. And what that involves a lot of times is really building, um, remodeling and refurbishing existing units. That can get very expensive. So that's really the balance that goes on. And to answer your question, I think it's happening every day, especially from a commercial, a for-profit review and it's very difficult to make the numbers work and to further this to see any significant improvement in um, addressing the demand in this state but i think that there's a lot of room there for work and a big part of it will be financing that we can get behind that but there's many communities out there that have these issues so greg to your point um on preservation, I did want to shout out that there's a session happening 
uh, tomorrow afternoon um, at 2 p.m. Um, about affordable housing preservation and community stability. Um, and and what, this is the why around um, why we need to make sure that we preserve affordable housing and we address um, the, those exact scenarios. So if you're, if you're interested in hearing more about that, I definitely recommend uh, tuning into that session uh, at two o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Okay, so it looks like, does anyone else have any other questions? I don't have anyone else in the queue. We, we may have time for just one more. While you wait for that, Kayla, I'll, I'll put in a plug for my session tomorrow, um, which is about who's implementing your town's housing plan. Um, you know, a lot of the strategies that we're talking about here in terms of increasing supply are in your town's housing plan. It's just, uh, you know, taking the next step to put them into practice. So we'll be talking about that tomorrow, kind of what some, you know, how we can make sure that the, you know, the plans that we've put in place actually get implemented over the next five years. Great. That's great, Jocelyn. Um, okay, we have one last question. We have time for one more. How about um, Francis Lane? Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, this is Francis Lane. I serve as a uh, public trustee on our Affordable Housing Trust Fund Board here down at Stanford. And uh, unfortunately, I, didn't, I wasn't able to sign up for everything. I want to attend every single conference. But um, our struggle down here is that they are talking about getting rid of our BMR um, housing program as far as, uh, of, um, as uh, ownership. And so I'm hoping that State of Connect is going to come up with some kind of fund to help us with that. And we're also struggling because we do have a lot of office parks down here that they want to convert. But it seems like that we're getting a lot more of the uh, at Mark Rickett housing or even luxury housing. So, um, you know, attending all these things, and I'm hoping we're going to see, you know, improvements what what's going on in the state in general. Thank you. Thanks, Francis. And, and Leslie, I don't know if you can speak to that. that. That's sort of your area. Have you been seeing that that same thing, that, that market rate luxury development been going on and how's that impacted? Yes, I have seen that actually. And, and that's why I'm nodding my head as she's talking about it and, and the person who's speaking before that as well. Um, it's It's something we're seeing, unfortunately, where we're trying to get that affordable housing opportunity out there and as Greg mentioned, it's just lumber is so expensive, material is so expensive, and the resources aren't there. As he mentioned, the average, I think, builder, he said it was like 65 years old. It's just all of those resources are not there. And when they're finally provided, they come at a very high price, unfortunately. So I'm seeing Fairfield County price, um, price homes extremely high, even when they're getting in there with the renovation loans, with the um, loans that are for, you know, construction loans. They're just knocked the house down, rebuilt it, and they're actually, they're making more money on them. It's not, it's not affordable in any way, unfortunately. Thanks, Leslie. All right, well, that brings us um, to the end of our session time. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, um, Jocelyn, Leslie, Greg, and Andrew. Um, this has been a really great discussion, um, and I hope that the dialogue continues outside of this one hour. Um, if you want to get in touch with any of the panelists, um, please check out um, the Affordable Housing Conference website um, for, for more information. And if you want to get in touch with the research team here at CHFA, um, you can email Andrew or I at research at CHFA.org. Okay. Thank you all very much. Have a great rest of the conference. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.